How do you do? I am Captain E.J. Smith. No doubt you've already heard I have recently announced my retirement from the White Star Line. The maiden voyage of Titanic will be my final crossing as ship's captain. My wife Eleanor will clarify that. It's been many good years since I first went to sea at age 12 as a cabin boy on a square rigger. I signed on with White Star at age 27. Since that time, I've had the good fortune of traveling with many fine people with whom I admire. As to how best to describe my experience of nearly 45 years at sea, I'd merely have to say it's been nothing out of the ordinary. Of course, there's always been the occasional winter gales, storms, fog, and the like, but on the whole, it's been uneventful. Sea trials for Titanic took place April the 2nd out of Belfast. We lit 20 boilers and achieved speeds of 18 knots. Stirred up quite a wake down River Lagan. The ship handles beautifully. It is designed for performance and above all, safety. I could not conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. Well, I played the role of the captain for 14 years all around the world. And uh, I heard after I worked for this particular company for a couple of years that owned the artifacts from the ocean floor that they were going to dive on the Titanic. And this was the year 2000 and I thought, boy, that would be nice if I could go. And I called them and I, I said, I'd like to throw my hat in the ring for this dive. And they said, no. And I thought, well, okay. Well, I waited two weeks. I called them again. I said, I'm, I, really, I'm the captain of the Titanic. The media asked me if I've ever been down to the, see the ship, and I have to tell them no, and I think it would be good if you could send me down. And they said, no, that's for archaeologists and important people. I remember World War II. I remember Winston Churchill making a famous speech. He said, we will fight them in the air, we will fight them on land, we will fight them at sea, but we will never surrender. And after the war, he was invited to speak at Harvard University. And the professor said to the students, whatever you do, get your pads and pens ready, because this man is wisdom. Well, they flew the man over from England Winston Churchill hoppled to the microphone and he said, never give up. Never, 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 never give up. And he turned around and sat down. Can you believe it? That was it. That was the whole speech. I never forgot that speech. I called him again, third time. And I said, I'm the captain of the Titanic. I'm in front of the camera. I'm in everyone's home. I'm the one that's talking about your exhibit. I believe if the media could say, this man's been down to the Titanic, more people would be interested in what I have to say about your exhibit, and you'll get more people there and you'll make more money. It got quiet on the other end of the phone. And the man said, I think you're right, come along. Then I wasn't sure I wanted to go. Well, think about it. You're in this little Russian submarine. You're going two and a half miles down. You're jammed into that little thing with two other men. It's 6,000 pounds of pressure per inch trying to crush you. They said, well, the first thing you do, if, if you get claustrophobia, forget it. And I said, well, I don't. Well, you'll need to get a, a letter from your doctor. You're not going to have a heart attack because we're not coming back. It cost RMS Titanic $4.87 a second. Can you imagine counting $5 bills every second for 12 hours? That's what it cost. Do the math. I'll figure it out for you. It's $216,000 every time a sub goes down. You better find something important. They said you'll need to give your wife power of attorney, get your last will and testament made. And you'll sign a release from RMS. You'll not hold them liable. And each time they were talking about it, it was building up. And I was thinking, I, I don't know if I really want to do this. And I, I said to my wife, Barbara, do you think I should go? She said, go. I'm not sure what that meant. 
But I did. I thought, well, I lived a long life. I've done a lot of things. I'll go. So I went to St. John's, Newfoundland. That's where you leave from. The, the location of the Titanic is about 600 miles or 800 miles straight east of Boston, 365 miles south, southeast of St. John's, Newfoundland. It takes a day and a half to get out to the site. And I was there in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, ready to go. And I heard that there was, going to be, there was a hurricane going over the site and they had used they have moved that Academia Celtis, the mothership, about 100 miles off the site. And we'd have to wait for two or three days. Well, I wasn't sure I'd get a chance to, to dive because I knew there were twice as many people going out. And he never said I could dive. He just said, come along. So I waited. I waited for three days. There was nothing. St. John's is a beautiful little town, but it only takes about 10 minutes to see it. So I went to see a movie. I saw the wrong movie, A Perfect Storm, going right over the Grand Banks. That's where we were going. Well, I got out to the site and they took one look at me and they said, you're too big, you'll never fit in there. I said, I'll fit in. Well, we don't have a fire suit big enough for you. What kind of a suit? What's this about a fire? Well, you'll be, you'll be breathing 100% oxygen. There's always a chance it'll flash to a fire. Well, if there's a fire, I'll last 10 seconds. What do I need a suit for? Well, they said it's for identification. Identification? I'm that tall guy down there. Well, night before the dive, the man that told me to come along, while I was eating dinner, bent over and he said, Lowell, you're going down in the morning. Oh, my heart began to pound. Oh, my goodness. You realize there's three times as many people been into outer space than have ever been down to see the Titanic? I was the 109th person. Well, of course, Fox Television followed us all over like I was an astronaut for the next 12 hours. And they told us what to pick up and what not to pick up if we could find certain things and so forth. And they'd put me in that little, little uh, sub that you saw in the movie. And the first thing I did was accidentally kicked over the oxygen tank. And that Russian pilot came alive real quick, straightened that thing up, gave me instructions. By the way, there's no place to sit. You're in a fetal position on your elbow for 12 hours. Can you imagine that? jammed into that little sub and it's so hot when they put you in there because it's August. So what you do is you you put on wool clothing, long winter underwear and so forth. And there you are. You're in that little sub and then they they tighten down that hatch. And when they do that, you know, that's it. You can't change your mind. And then they lift you up, set you overboard. And you're bobbing around in there and it's so hot and you unzip down to your waist and it rains inside all the time. It's condensation. They give you a towel to dry off. Well, that's nice of them. But I'm looking through that little round four and a half inch port light at this beautiful green, blue green water. And we're bobbing around and after a few moments, all of a sudden it starts getting darker. And then with a matter of 10 minutes time, it's completely black. You know that feeling that you get when you go to a show and just before the curtain opens up, you, the house lights dim and you can see the light under the curtain. You know that feeling of anticipation that you have? I had that for two and a half hours. I'm not going to see a movie. I'm going to see the real thing. And for the next two and a half hours, it's completely black. And you're lying on your back. And then he said, we're almost there. And he turned on the lights and I looked through that light and I didn't like what I saw. The ocean floor was coming up too fast and we actually bounced off the ocean floor. I didn't need that. I said, where are we in relationship to the bow? He said, well, if you want to go to the bow, we'll have to go now. We're in the debris field. I said, good. I didn't realize everything I'm saying is being recorded. 
I wasn't supposed to be sightseeing, but he took me to the bow. And I went to that spot where they held out their arms in the movie and said, I'm the king of the world. I went over the main hatch, up the crow's nest, up on the bridge. I saw the telemotor. Then I said, I'd like to see the captain's cabin. I'd heard that the side was already gone, and they took me there. And I could see the captain's bathtub for Ten minutes, I was five feet from his bathtub while they were changing film. Then I said, let's go to work. And we did. And I found the emergency telegraph that Officer Murdoch used. It said, this is not a drill, full stop, full astern. I found the ranch, the mouth on it was 19 inches across. Can you imagine sticking straight up in the ocean floor like somebody had thrown a javelin? I found a water heater. I found a... I found a hat, a man's hat, a derby hat. It was just in mint condition. They have mechanical arms, you know, and the Russian pilot has the controls. He's the only one that has a seat. And uh, you pick up these items and a basket goes out and you let them go and they fall into the basket. Well, he picked up that derby hat, he let go of it and it disintegrated. It just like a cloud, it was gone. I found a lot of things, technical things, that kept me emotionally unattached from what really took place. But after about an hour, when you see a shoe and you see a hat, it just all of a sudden hit me how difficult it would be for me to say goodbye to my wife and children, knowing I'd never see them again. The last 30 minutes had to be horrible for those men on board the Titanic. Can you imagine? 1,500 souls went into eternity that quick. You know, we never really know how much time we have on this earth. 9-11 happened. 3,000 people thought it's going to be a wonderful day. They're going to go home tonight. It didn't happen. You know, we are all going to face the reality of death at one time or another. And maybe this is your time to think about it. Think about it. Are you prepared? Are you ready to meet God? Well, you're either going to heaven or hell. The Bible says or God sent his son Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And all he wants us to do is to personally invite him into our life. And we can be born into his family. And we can be assured of eternity. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages or our paycheck for sinning is death. That means complete separation from God. In other words, death in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And to as many as will receive him, to them he gives the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Get your name in the Lamb's book of life. Put your foot in the lifeboat that God has prepared for you. We are all going to be faced for it. Be ready to do it. In fact, let's do it right now. It's your destiny. You're watching this program. You thought by accident. No, this was on time. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. This is your moment of decision. Bow your head and pray this little prayer with me, but mean it from the bottom of your heart. Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sin. He was buried and rose again, proving that he was God. And right now, the best I know how in front of this television, I ask you to come into my heart. Be the Lord and master of my life. Help me to live for you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. It's as simple as that. You are now born into God's family. You belong to him. He wants what's best for you. That doesn't mean life's going to be rosy and glossy for the rest of it. There's going to be ups and downs. But he is your heavenly father. He wants nothing but what's good for you. So we accept that by faith. It's called abundant life. Welcome to the new life. Well, there's a few things you need to do. Number one, you need to make sure you tell someone what you've done today. And number two, you need to pray. Talk to God. Thank him today for, what, for coming into your heart and giving you eternal life. And three, you need to let God speak to you. He does that through his word, the Bible. 
open it up to the book of book of John and then the Romans and then Acts and uh, and study it and then the fourth thing find yourself into a a good Bible preaching church someone that talks about Jesus make sure you uh, tell your friends about him and uh, God bless you I'm so glad you tuned into this on the on the internet today to see this and uh, I'll see you in glory. It's as simple as that because God said so in Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God bless you.